Hello and welcome back to Supercar Secrets brought to you by supercarsmonaco.com. Today we're going to have a look at a buyer's guide for one of the most beautiful and iconic Ferraris of them all, the Dino. And here to talk us through is our resident expert on classic cars, Ian Tyrrell. Ian, what a beautiful car. Tell me a little bit about the, the design and the history of the Dino range. Well, as you've said, it's, it's one of the most iconic models. Um, it started out as a styling exercise. The, uh, well, it started out as an engine, actually, because Dino was short for Alfredino, who was Enzo Ferrari's son. And um, the engine was a, a V6 that was used for developed by him for Formula 2. It was his brainchild. And um, Enzo Ferrari wanted to honor the memory of his son because he was very, very traumatized by his son's death. He took it very badly. So he started a, um, a model of car, a new lineup of car. Um, he, he commissioned Piniferina to design a, a very slippery mid-engined uh, body shape called the, uh, the Dino. And um, Aldo Provarone at Piniferina, the stylist, uh, came up with a, pin a prototype they went through that stage a couple of times, and then they, um, they come, came up with the Dino production car, the, the 206, as it was called. And um, actually, they didn't realize it, but it was pioneering uh, on a grand scale because it was the first mid-engined uh, Ferrari production car. And of course, over 50% of Ferrari's sales since have been mid-engine cars. So huge step change for Ferrari, really. And, and very different to the, um, the Daytona that was a, a, a kind of a, around at the same time, a great big front engine Grand Tour. This is such a, a nimble uh, mid-engine car in comparison. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and for, exactly right. I mean, Ferrari's um, sort of stereotypical car at that time was a big, beefy front engine rear wheel drive V12, um, front, you know, front engine and gearbox, maybe a transaxle at the back, but very much a sort of classical formula. Um, and in fact, Enzo Ferrari, when, when they first launched the Dino, was so nervous about it not being accepted that um, he created the Dino brand. So when the Dinos, all through their production, they didn't have a Ferrari badge on them. Um, and in fact, people blanched at that so much that Marinello Concessionaires, the, the UK importers, to use this example, actually bought a load of Ferrari badges and stuck them on Dinos. So that when people were paying their four and a half thousand pounds or thereabouts, they, they actually knew they were buying a Ferrari and not a Dino. Um, and the original sales brochure for Dinos, the wording actually said, tiny, brilliant, safe, almost a Ferrari. Wow. <laughs> That's an interesting branding exercise that a lot of people would shudder at today. Yeah, he was hedging his bets. If it was a failure, he was protecting his core V12 brand. But um, of course, history has been, you know, the Dino carved out a whole niche of its own. And as I say, that, that and its successors have been responsible for over 50, over half Ferrari production since. Staggering statistic, really. Yeah, and then I think the, the after a few years, it got an upgrade and a bigger engine and some other bits and pieces were added to, to enhance the model further. That's right. Uh, the, the first series, the two leads, um, the, they were quite close to their racing heritage. They had a sort of uh, cast alloy block. And then um, when they productionized it later, in, to give it a bit more torque as well, they upped the CC by 400 CC to 2.4 liter. Um, and they sort of productionized the block by making it cast iron and more in line with Fiat's other foundry products, really, and Ferraris, in a way. Because I suppose this was the, uh, the period when, when Fiat got heavily involved with, with the company. So, so did that lead to changes in the way Ferrari went about you know, producing and marketing the Dino? Well, yes. Um, in fact, the Dino was pivotal it, the Fiat Dino and the Ferrari Dino were pivotal in cementing the relationship between Enzo Ferrari um, and Giovanni Agnelli, the head of Fiat at the time. Um, 
and they they um, they were sort of liking the look of each other, uh, seeing how, you know, treading carefully uh, with the first Dino project, the Fiat Dino, to homologate the engine so that Ferrari could use it in Formula Two, and it was a huge stepping stone for both of them because the Dino was the car that cemented Fiat and Ferrari's relationship, which survives to this day, of course. Fiat own Ferrari now. So, so what are we talking about in terms of production numbers of the Dino across its life cycle, uh, Ian? Yeah. The, three, the three models essentially, 206 GT, 246 GT and 246 GTS, uh, under 4,000, round about 3,700 in total. Okay, and is there any kind of um, variance in the desirability of those models? Is it based on age or is it more based on the, the later ones being thought of as better because they've got the bigger engine and so on? What's the kind of collector's view of the different models in the range? Well, the, the, the most collectible of the three is the ultra rare 206 GT. Uh, it had the alloy block engine, which was lighter. Um, it had alloy bodywork, which is considered lighter as well. Um, so, uh, and they were the sort of first pure Dino, very much within the original vision. Um, then we had the 246 GT, which was a more production ready car, steel body, cast iron block. Um, so the 206 was the most desirable. 246 GT, not so desirable, but then the target top model came. And they, they, this is where things really got interesting because the, the 246 GTS, the target top one, like this car here, um, was the first open top mid-engine Ferrari production car. And um, that was when, you know, the, the Magnum Ferrari, we remember the 308 GTS, for example, um, that became the sort of um, the, the halo um, model, the 246 GTS. So 206 is the most valuable. The Targa top one, very rare actually, very low production numbers. Um, some people don't prefer the, um, the window at the, at the back here. Um, they're not so keen on this, on this styling feature here, that the GT has a sort of little quarter window here, which people generally consider prettier, but the GTS is, um, you know, it's got the open top motoring, so it, it's considered uh, desirable for that reason. But, uh, this one also has the, the, the um, what I think are called the chairs and flares features. Tell us about yeah. that. So, um, the, the, towards the end of production, what uh, Ferrari offered as a couple of option, options, they brought out the Daytona um, and Pininfarina had come up with a, a really fabulous design for the seats in the Daytona with a sort of ribbed um, almost like a rib cage on the seat, for want of a better way of putting it, a skeleton effect, but it looked amazing. Um, this car's got it. So we've got the, um, we've got the, these are the Daytona seats. Um, so that's the chairs bit. And this was a factory optional extra at the time um, to replace the sort of standard plane. It was either like, a, a, for want of a better way of putting it, a toweling material that they had on them new. Um, and as a, an option, you could have either vinyl or leather. And then um, a super rare other option on the car was these seven inch, seven and a half inch wide Campagnola wheels, um, which are embossed here with Dino. Um, and they were, um, because they were wider, I mean, really seven and a half inch wide wheels in the 1970s, was, early 70s was quite wide. What Ferrari had to do was, um, instead of a sort of standard little wheel arch here, they had to flare the wheel arches out um, quite drastically to keep it legal so that it wasn't spraying up beyond the, the bodywork. Hence the expression chairs and flares. And, and, and just give us an idea of how rare these cars are, are you? Well, in right-hand drive form, uh, they were quite popular in America. By popular, I mean... Um, probably over a hundred, but in the UK they made 15 of the GTs, in other words the non-target top cars, um, and right-hand drive they made, you ready for this, seven. Wow, so that is one of the seven you've got there in your workshop. This is number four of the seven, yes. 
Wow. So, 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 so what does all this translate to in terms of values across the range from the 206 right the way through to this one? Right. The 206 is, um, is a half million pound plus car if it's in the right condition with the right provenance. <coughs> um, 246 GTs, a nice one in pounds. Generally, they made 448 right-hand drive, if I'm not mistaken. Um, around about 250,000 pounds. Um, a normal GTS, without the chairs and flares, around about 350,000 um, pounds. It doesn't affect the value of the normal GTS too much if they've been converted to chairs and or flares because um, you could have either or instead of just both. But the, the fact that it's got this combination, um, it was ordered from you with the Daytona seats and the flares, you're uplifting 20% above, a good 20% above the price of a 246 GTS, just for this option. Okay, wow. And, and so let's assume I'm in the market to buy a car like this. Um, what are some of the things I should be looking out for? What are the things that uh, might cost me a lot of money if I'm not uh, careful in the particular model that I, I acquire? Well, um, the big thing with Dino's is bodywork. Uh, 1970s car, there was hardly any rust proofing on them. Um, even as young as two years old, they were rusting quite badly in, in the UK's climate and the UK's roads. And it's pretty much the same around the world. Uh, rust-free dinos were, um, you know, non-existent, really. So the important thing, without a shadow of a doubt, is the bodywork. It has to have been uh, correctly restored, preferably with a photographic record to show the work that's been done. Um, and things have got to be absolutely accurate. So, I mean, you look at this panel gap here, it's beautifully parallel all the way across. And this car is finished in black, which is its original factory color. And of course, black shows up every imperfection. Um, but you know, you can see the panel work on this car is utterly superb. It's beautifully flat here. Um, this line is nice and crisp along the bottom. This panel here has been done properly. Quite often you can tell if a Dino has been substandard restored because the bodywork isn't 100% on it. And really these days, the market won't tolerate anything less than 100%. It's got to be like that. And, and this one has actually been through a, 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 a really detailed uh, restoration right. process, has it? It has. It's by, by one of the sort of name restoration specialists in the UK. So there's a, um, a record of every bit of work that was done to the car. Yeah. So, so as a sort of cautionary tale, if I was to buy one that had had a, a poor restoration done and then I was to give it to one of these top firms to get into the sort of condition of this car, what kind of bill might I be looking at? Uh, well, to, to restore one of these cars properly, we, we actually restored another car for a customer, another GTS, um, <coughs> which had been in a museum, excuse me, for 30 years and was in a really, really bad state. Um, we did everything to that car. And I think it, it ended up at about 1,500 man hours of work, plus all the materials. So um, they're not a cheap car to do properly. You're talking north of a couple of hundred thousand pounds plus VAT to do a proper job. Okay, that's uh, pretty significant. And what about the mechanical side of the Dino? Anything I should look out for there? The engine needs to be quiet. Um, it needs to be, if it's clattering and making all sorts of horrible noises, big alarm signs, really. Again, you want to see history of it being looked after. Um, in period, the, the camshafts on the engine, they had sort of um, quite uh, wild cams, as people would say in, in everyday parlance. Um, big valve lift, big cam lobes. They tended to wear out quite significantly. But these days, you know, it's a different world. People keep on top of these things. They don't just drive dinos into the ground as an everyday mode of transport. Um, but, you, you know, it needs to have, um, have been, again, properly prepared and serviced and um, adjusted and set up by a specialist, really. And you want to see okay. documentary evidence of that. Okay, documentary evidence. So, um, well, that's, that's a fascinating tour of a, of a very interesting uh, car, and, and obviously you've got one of the rarest ones there. So, 
if, uh, if anyone is interested, at the time we are filming this, the, the Dino is available. So if you contact us through the supercarsmonaco.com site, we can start a conversation with Ian about it. But obviously, I guess cars like this are, are so rare that they probably don't hang around for too long when you do get hold of them in. Well, when you get to this level, I mean, um, th this, is a, this is the sort of car that will go into a serious collection. Somebody who buys this car um, could possibly have other Ferraris already. Maybe not, but maybe so. Um, and I know that at least um, four of the other cars are buried deeply in collections and will never really come to market anytime soon. So that makes this, you know, a very interesting car, really. So it's, it's, it's really more like a one in three chance of having one like this available then? Precisely, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks for sharing the Dino story with us, Ian. And uh, join us again for another Supercar Secrets very soon.